Yeah, what's up? What's good? It's your boy BQ back up in the place to be. This is the Negative BQ YouTube channel. This is your Impact Lounge Impact Wrestling Review. TNA Impact Wrestling Review. It's still, still taking me a minute to uh, to spit that out uh, for 7-11 Slurpee Day 2024. Again, I'm your boy BQ. If it's your first time here, you're checking me out, you kind of dig the review, I give a pretty honest review. Consider hitting that subscribe button. So I recorded this podcast yesterday. I don't typically have the screen up that shows my face because I have notes in its place. And when I finished the podcast, I looked down and the recording had stopped. Um. It was about 51 minutes through the podcast, and I think I podcasted about an hour. So it wasn't too bad, but I mean, still, I was like, you have to effing be kidding me. So I'm going to pay a little bit closer attention to that today, mm -hmm. and hopefully that doesn't happen. Um, Real quick, before we kind of uh, do this, so uh, before we talk TNA, um, so last month, uh, you know, if you remember, I was gone on vacation for about four days, so I did not do a impact review. So same boat this month, um, but it's going to be a little longer. So from the 21st to the 27th of July, I will be out of town on my honeymoon. Um, I think 21st and 27th are my travel days, and then I'm, I'm, we're doing a, a – my wife booked it, but I think it's a, a, a cruise in, a, in, a, in Mexico. Uh, from 22 to 26. So I will be completely out of pocket. I um, I have no intention to watch wrestling, to talk about wrestling. Um, I, I will completely disconnect myself from social media. I did it for the four days I was on vacation before, but I mean, I really will this time. So don't even, don't even bother with your DMs <laughs> about telling me what's going on in TNA because I will not care that week. I can promise you that right now. So uh, I think that's going to be the fallout episode from Slammiversary, if I'm not mistaken. But I will not. I have no intentions of reviewing that episode. Most likely, will not watch it. So, um, I mean, I will find out the results so that I'm up to speed on things. But uh, don't expect a review that week for the episode, and then we'll be back in the place to be uh, top of August. So, um. And then I've got coming up here. I don't have my dates finalized, but I'm going to be doing 20 uh, active duty military days. And that throws me off a little bit schedule wise, just because with my normal job, I work overnights with this job. I work during the day, so I'm able to do a lot of my content in the morning. Um, so it's going to be a little bit difficult to pull off, but uh, we'll, we'll make it happen. But just, yeah, no end of July. Just know that the 21st through 27th, I will be gone out of the country. Shit. Um, and there will be no wrestling in my life. Maybe, maybe a different kind, if you know what I mean. But uh, no wrestling in my life other than that. So, But, uh, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. You know, I got married back in October, and it's just now was the opportunity to finally get this um, this honeymoon knocked out. So, so long awaited and uh, very excited about it. Uh, what else we got? TNA sold out Slammiversary. That happened last night after I recorded the first time. So uh, that's something new. So we're at 4,000 seats. We'll see if they open anything else. I mean, they might. We're pretty close to Slammiversary, though. Slammiversary has been a really odd build this year because it, it, was, it like started really late. It's been really, really slow. And the reason I say it's odd this year is because Slammiversary is typically the pay-per-view that they go all out. You know, we wonder who's going to show up, who's going to be a part of the show. You know, the, the storylines have kind of built for several months. It's bound for glory that typically gets these really last-minute builds and hard to kill as well. So usually the good build is Slammiversary, Rebellion is second, Bound for Glory third, hard to kill fourth. So usually this is the one that they put a lot of effort into, but it hasn't been the case this time around. I think they kind of sacrificed build for, uh, we, we know we're going to have a sellout 
in Montreal, you know, 4,000 people. And um, Slammiversary, they usually put on a good show. So, you know, I, I think they just count on the fact, hey, people are going to be there in the crowd. The problem is if you don't do a good job on television, who's going to order the show? That's, you know, they're, they're two totally different things. You can't say, oh, well, the build wasn't great, but the crowd's going to be great. They're completely, they're completely different. You know, you know what I'm saying? So am I excited for Slammiversary? Not really. Let me not say that. I'm always somewhat excited. I mean, am I overly excited in comparison to other pay-per-views? No. You know, I'm looking forward to it, but that's about it because I think it's this week, right? The go home show, the go home show is this week. It's my knowledge. Isn't Slammiversary the 20th or something like that? Uh, this upcoming episode actually looks good. I usually hate go homes, but uh, this this one looks interesting. They still got to throw a couple show matches at us and some some pre show matches. So I don't know. As I said, very very odd build this year. Let's get into the episode, which I thought was a pretty decent show. I thought it started it off very very well, and then it you know it kind of dipped out. It the shows do that from time to time. It's not time to time. That's usually pretty much how the show is formatted like they give us you know the first half hour is very good uh the next for sake of argument because i know there's commercials for the sake of argument we'll say the the next hour is is can be very substandard it can have a lot of santino in the past have a lot of scott and then the the final 30 minutes usually picks up so this was no different this kicks off as usual uh, with, with slow motion highlights, Tom Hannafin is yelling at us at the top of his lungs. Uh, I appreciate his passion. There's nothing I could win the lottery today, and I would not yell that loud about anything. Uh, it's almost like he's a pirate. Oh, you know, he's almost not even saying words at this point. It's just, oh. but lots of yelling, lots of yelling. They kick it off with some cinematic stuff. And uh, this is this is with Frankie Kazarian. He's smoking a cigar. I guess they ended the episode with this last week. I guess I just missed it. This was a continuation. Uh, I just stopped watching the episode at the very end, so I guess I just missed that. <laughs> he says, uh, "Frankie says something along the lines of, what are you filming?'" He's already being filmed number one, and uh, number two, Nick Ryan Amethyst is standing there. With his cell phone. And this looked really good. I could do without the music. You already know that. Uh, but it but it looked good. And it looks like we're going to get a lot more cinematic stuff backstage. Which is really nice. And, and I don't mean cinematic as far as matches. But just with angles and everything. Looks like a movie. Look, it looked good. I thought it was a nice way of starting off the show. It's one of those things where I say present wrestling different. Boom. So I can really dig it. Nick Nemeth comes out of nowhere. Apparently, Frankie Kazarian is the one that jumped Nick Nemeth. They they play those dango. I barely even remember. I just remember uh, footage of Nick Nemeth laying in the stairs and Tom Hannafin very fakely said, hey, is that Nick Nemeth? So I um, guess it was Frankie Kazarian. So that's going to be the angle going forward. They're going to do some Frankie and Nick Nemeth stuff. That should be very good. Um, the one thing that was about, about this, that was not very good was, and, and this is my own personal taste, but he hits Frankie with a super kick. So we're doing wrestling moves in the, the alleyways behind the arena. But what was really bad was that Frankie was on the ground and Nick was kicking him, but he was clearly missing his head. He was just kicking the garage. There was no, no contact with the guy's body whatsoever. Uh, but other than that, it was a really nice way to kick off the show. I look forward to do them to them doing more of this type of cinematic stuff with with other people. You know, um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how much they utilize it going forward. But it was it was a very nice touch. It's presenting wrestling differently. Um, there's my cat's fucking fighting, pissing me off. Hey, that, 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 that. I got nothing to throw at him. Duh, duh. Wish I had a hat here or something. Anyway. Um. Another nitpicky thing I have about this is that we we have this like really cool 
angle kicking off. And then Tom Hannafin very fakely again is, now we know who attacked Nick Nemeth. And then he goes right into fucking, welcome to the 1500 arena, whatever the hell was sold out. I mean, he completely no sells what we just saw. And that's, that's for me, I've talked about this over the years, like editing television. When you have something big like that, like let us, let us soak it in. If it means you have to cut to a commercial, whatever, like let us soak it in rather than we have this big, you know, kind of reveal cool cinematic thing backstage. Tom had saying, now we know who did it. And then just running down the fucking card or whatever he was doing. Like it just a very odd transition for me. We've got, um, what do we hit? We kick it off with Jordan Grace's open challenge. She, she's just fighting anybody. And uh, one thing that I liked here, they, they didn't do it every match and they don't do it every wrestler, but they've, they're experimenting with Jade. She comes front and center. They're on camera. We see her announcing the wrestler and we see the wrestler over her left shoulder entering. I think that's again presenting wrestling differently. It, geez, I'm gonna kill these fucking cats. I'm gonna have to hit pause. They're my two good cats, and those are the two freaking fighting right now, pissing me off. All right, I have resumed my recording. Let's get back to what we were saying. So again, I, I think it's a very nice touch. It looks good on screen. It's it's presenting wrestling different. The Jordan Grace comes out, uh, to, and the number one contender is Izzy Dame of NXT. And Jade paused here like she was going to announce uh, Charlotte Flair coming out and her opponent. And there's a good like, what felt like a 10 second pause. I mean, it it was it was. And then from NXT, Izzy Dame, who. But anyway, she comes out. She's 5'11". I can dig it. You know, uh, she, she had a pretty decent look. And the match was okay. It, it, was, it wasn't bad. It was, um, you know, we have Jordan, who's 5'2", 5'3". We got Izzy Dame. They, or they, I think she's, they said 5'10". I think 5'11 is a little tall, but it's tall. But they said 5'10". I enjoyed the match for what it was. I, and, you know, I bring this up every week. They're just throwing... Jordan's just wrestling on the show. That's it. She's just she's just wrestling. I think this is her fourth NXT opponent at this point, uh, which is very cool. But if you do if you disagree with me, say no. Jordan's not just wrestling. She's doing all this good shit. What's your favorite Jordan Grace storyline this year? Answer that question for me. All right. And I'm not talking about her going to NXT. There was a report that came out that uh, confirmed what I said last podcast where I had said, I don't think the contract is up in 2026 like the fans are reporting. And I mean the fans. They're the ones saying it. Uh, I said I it, I was under the belief between Bound for Glory and Hard to Kill. Or I think I said something like that, uh, that the contract was up. And it, it appears that's the case. So they uh, restructured a contract. Is it possible it's done to renegotiate with TNA? Absolutely. Absolutely that's that's a that's a possibility. I give that about a 10% chance of why this happened though. So, uh you know, well her time's done folks. I don't <laughs> Oh my god. Um anyway. So, during this match, before the match, Iceman comes out yelling and if you have been in the arena it, it hurts your ears, the level this guy's yelling at. And I was kind of looking forward to just getting the match. I don't need him coming out every single time. You probably don't either. Uh, and, and they say Ash by Elegance is going to watch via satellite, which apparently via satellite is still a thing. She was on her cell phone. Um, all you can see were titties um, and blonde hair. But she was on her cell phone. I mean, I, can you... I, like, is that a thing anymore via satellite? I mean, can you just go on Zoom and put her phone in front of the camera or in front of a screen? You know what I'm saying? Um, but it's still comedy. It's 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 
we're here, you know, what, a week away from the show. It's still comedy with this, this fucking angle. And I just, I cannot wait for this match to be over. I cannot wait for them to be done. I've talked to them so I'm blue in my face about how I thought they they blew this. I used blue twice there. That's pretty cool. That they really blew what they were trying to do here. They tried to do a slow build. They fucking dropped the ball, and it's so bad. And I just want the match to be over with. I don't care. I guess it doesn't matter. It's like one of Jordan's final matches anyway. Um, we got Santino backstage, and he is, um, he's got this thing in front of him. He says, we're going to do a wild card match. Love the concept. Something different. Love the concept. It wasn't very random. It was the two baby faces versus the two heels in the match. Nick Nemeth's face wasn't going to show up on there. Uh, I guess Frankie Gazarian's couldn't, but I guessed he wouldn't since he kicked off the show with an angle. Um, so yeah, so we get, you know, Josh Alejandro and Joe Henley versus Steve McLean and Moose. So that's going to be the main event for the evening. Again, I like the concept. It was just predictable. And it got me thinking they have, they have experimented with this concept a couple times over the years. Obviously the main one being Joker's wild, which I always thought was a great concept. The shows were always horrible because they were one night onlys. And um, when I talk about them being more impact wrestling than being TNA, that's kind of what I I envisioned when they rebranded the TNA that they were going to bring some old things back. And that just hasn't been the case. It's it's just kind of been a better version of impact wrestling. And I would love to see Joker's Wild come back. They did a, uh, I think. It wasn't mixed match because that was what WWE did. It was um, the wrestlers were paired up with their their uh, the person they were feuding with, and they did, did a tag team tournament. If you guys remember this, uh, and Sammy Callahan and Tessa Blanchard won, and then they faced each other for a number one contendership. Number one, that was super predictable because the only team announced was Sammy and Tessa, but um, that was a great concept too. You know. What a great way to blow off a pay-per-view. It was actually blowing off Slammiversary, I believe, uh, by having everyone tag with the person that they wrestled, have a tournament, and then build your number one contender for Bound for Glory. That's, that's fucking money to me, folks. That's, that's, that's great freaking booking right there, but we're just getting away from those creative things. And that's one of the things that drew me to TNA at one point. One of the reasons I wanted a podcast and cover, I love the creative things they were doing. It just wasn't being, you know, presented and delivered properly. But then we got baby face Zachary Wentz versus Charlie Dempsey. I, I had to laugh at this because <laughs> they came out like white meat baby faces, Wentz and, and uh, Trey Miguel. They were just heels last week. And as a matter of fact, to the people in the arena, they were just heels 30 minutes ago. I've told this story before. If you're someone who's listened to me from the very, very beginning, you've heard this, but I'm going to repeat it. This was right around the time I started podcasting. I'm in the impact zone in Orlando. There's a match. Eli Drake versus Grado. Grado's contract is on a ladder. At the time, Jesse Goddard was Eli Drake's tag team partner. I thought they were actually a great pairing. It was very short lived, but I thought there was I thought they looked really good together. Uh Jesse Goddard came down during the match and he's, you know, trying to cost Grado the match. And for us there in the arena, no shit, 30, 45 minutes later, he comes out, Jesse Goddard's white meat baby face as part of the returning bromance, which no one was asking for. It was a bit he was better off with Eli Drake at the time, but no one was asking for the bromance, but they returned. But we go from him trying to cost Grado to white beat babyface 45 minutes later. And uh, that's funny. That's what it, I just had uh, flashbacks of that moment when I saw these guys coming out um, as babyfaces. The match was very good. Charlie Dempsey looks like the guy who played Kerry Von Erich in the Iron Claw. So I wasn't... Um, I wasn't like excited to see what he could do. I was like, he doesn't really look like a wrestler. 
but he could work. He could really work. I enjoyed it. And, you know, clearly we're going to see him going forward, doing some stuff with the Rascals, but I was into it. You know, I thought it was pretty good. I thought he was very good. Uh, there, there's one thing about NXT. The show sucks. The acting sucks, but the wrestling is pretty good. So we get a, a, a run in. Um, big surprise, right? Big, big surprise. Miles Bourne and, and Tom Hannafin's on commentary like this whole episode up to this point, acting like he knows who the fuck these people are. Like Izzy Dame comes out. He's like, very interesting. Motherfucker, you have no idea, just like we we don't, who that is. And then, you know, Charlie Dempsey and Miles Bourne, and he knows, oh, it's Miles Bourne. Like, okay, dude. Um, so they do, you know, they they do a run in. Uh, Charlie Dempsey gets a win, and then they do guess the fuck what a post match attack, and they did a move here. It was something like they put it. Um, Trey or Wentz in a hammer lock and then Irish whip into a power slam. I thought that was cool. You know, I, I get the feeling when I watch the few times I watch NXT that there is, you know, they're under pressure to be original in the ring, to come up with original finishers. And the moves are usually pretty cool. Un unlike TNA where we're winning with running knees and clotheslines and shit like that. But I thought it was a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool move. So, um, you know, I tell you what, I think I said this last week. It seems like right now that their formula is you want to see a clean finish, watch the pay-per-view, give us our, our money. Because there are so many run-ins and attacks and, I mean, nothing's clean on this show anymore. Unless it's a squash match, it's, it's almost like nothing's clean. Then we get the system backstage. Uh, they're saying the same shit they always say, except they've got James, uh, Johnny Dango Curtis with them. They're still doing the close-ups. We can see the the snot in their nostrils, the hair in their noses. Um, Dango is not a part of the system yet. He did say trust the system at the end. I rewound to see if he said it. I don't think he's going to be part of the system because it doesn't seem like it fits, like it works. That's why they keep telling you he's not an official member yet. I don't, I, I just don't see him actually joining the group. I hope that he does. I just don't see it. Then the no quarter catch crew is walking around in the dark backstage. And this is back to back. The system set it and a no quarter catch crew set it within 30 seconds of each other. We're the most dominant stable in pro wrestling. Santino comes out out of nowhere as usual. Uh, lets them know there's going to be a six man tag team match next week with someone from our world that knows your world. I don't know if they announced the person or not. I really don't remember them running down the. I mean, I mean, I remember them running down the card. I just don't remember if they announced that person. So I'm not going to say uh, because I didn't see it. I just heard someone else say it. Um, then we had Kushida versus Gresham versus Bailey. So. Where we had the first two matches where I enjoyed them. This one, although I recognized that it was good, it was too choreographed for my taste. And we knew who was winning. And of course, Cheeseball Mike Bailey won. And then guess what? A post-match attack. It's the Secret Service, the Social Security, whatever comes out. Um with Ali and Campaign Singh, and they attack Cheeseball Mike Bailey. And this is, um, I, I see a lot of praise for this storyline on social media. And it, it's, you know, it, it's going to be the match of the night. And everything Ali does, whether it's his promos, his matches, really everything that he does is very good. He's completely carried this storyline. Mike Bailey has outed absolutely nothing to it this has been all all uh mustafa ali it's definitely the match people are looking forward to definitely but they uh you know the social security grabs grabs a cheese ball and they're gonna hit him and he's saying do it do it you must have saw cody rhodes acting on a 
WWE this week. And instead he hits uh they take out Trent. I'll have a number seven, hits him with a with a chair in the leg. Then he puts him in a sharpshooter. This was not a good visual. This looked like he was flipping over a sack of sod, like he was gonna, you know, work on the lawn. Uh so put him in a the sharpshooter to try to build a little sympathy. And then we're getting this at um Slammiversary. Then we've got Steph Double D Lander walking on the beach talking about PCO. And this was bad, but good at the same time. You know, I've just, I've said many times, I don't really hate it. It's purposely cheesy. She says she's going to go back to Australia to tie up some loose ends with some old flames. But she has one question. Will you wait for me? We know that she has a real life boyfriend. I think it's Vance Warner. And then obviously they tease <laughs> that uh, Matt Cardona is her other boyfriend. This most likely is going to lead to some sort of angle turning on PCO. Most likely. But but maybe not. I mean, I don't think anyone cares about Steph Delander that much at this point. So I don't think we're going to miss her from television. But she's just she wrote herself off TV here. She's not signed to the company, so she wrote herself off TV to do whatever she's going to do. Um, and we'll see what happens here. But anything, anything to not have PCO walking around backstage yelling names. But that's, I, I think the safe bet is one of those two guys, most likely Matt Cardona, uh, comes back and gets involved. It, it just seems like it would go that direction. I talked about the build for Slam Reversary, right? I was saying, hey, this is a slow build. I don't think it's the um, the, the best best card. I think it's actually the worst card they've put together in a couple of years, in, in all honesty. I do think that. That doesn't mean I think it's a bad card. I just think it's not a, not a great card. And a kick out. What the hell? So that being said, I was like, well, at least we're going to get the system versus the Hardys. That's what I assumed the tag team title match was. Uh, no, we're getting that on free TV next week. The graphic doesn't even have the system in it. It's just the Hardys. Because we're getting the long-awaited con- uh, the long-awaited contractually obligated rematch at Slammiversary. So we're getting the system versus ABC at Slammiversary. And that's why I say it's the worst card, because I don't think anyone cares to see it. I'm not saying it's it's going to be bad, but it's it's. Ever since I've been covering the company, they've done very few rematches at pay per views. Very few. Usually, pay per views are very very fresh when it comes to the card. When I say rematch, I don't mean like the two people haven't wrestled before, but they don't do recent rematches. Like hey, uh, like WWE would do that. Okay, say. John Cena wins the title from Randy Orton. Well, the next pay-per-view, they're going to have a rematch. They don't They don't typically uh, do the rematches like that. They'll be like on TV. They'll knock them out real quick or whatever, but it, it doesn't usually go out this long. And, I mean, I want to give them props at the same time because I have complained about them doing these contractually obligated rematches too quickly. But these ones are very drawn out to the point that I don't think anyone cares. Like we're getting Spitfire versus Militia. Who the fuck cares, right? Um, so it's whatever. But I'm I'm actually shocked that they did. They're doing this Hardys on free TV. That tells me they're likely not part of Slammiversary. They're not, they're likely not part of the company going forward. They're just saying, hey, we got to knock out this match. And because there's there's been no, um, no sign that Jeff Hardy is doing anything of no for the company. He made the return. The return was awesome. It couldn't have been done any better. Huge pop road warrior pop. You know what I mean? It was, it was massive, but there was, there's just been nothing to, uh, to make us believe that he's doing anything going forward. Maybe he's doing this match and then the Hardys are done. I don't know. You know, um, they're waiting for that WWE call. Definitely. So, We'll see, but it, it's a little disappointing we're just getting this on TV next week. Then we get Rhino, the human iPhone. That almost rhymes, Rhino and iPhone. 
Maybe I should just call him iPhone going forward. He's coming out because everyone in the crowd is 48 years old and loves ECW. They said the winner of this match is going to take on PCO at Slammiversary. I knew damn well we were not getting PCO versus fucking Rhino at Slammiversary. So great opening promo by AJ Francis. Always does an excellent job. Always, always, always. Just like uh, what I was saying with Mustafa Ali, everything AJ Francis does is great. Since 2024 kicked off and they added Ali and they added AJ Francis, they've been major, major highlights of the show. They've really spiced things up to where the shows are not so bland as they were in 2023. Now, I knew exactly what was going to happen here. I, I, I said this last week. I knew exactly what was going to happen. And that's what happened. The match lasts about 45 seconds. Rich Swan gets in there, interrupts. Santino comes out and lets us know it's a Philadelphia street fight. So that means Rich Swan can continue to stay out there and they can wrestle two-on-one for the whole match. But we knew this was going fucking old school. I mean, this is, this is, uh, you know, you, match after match, year after year, they come to. That was my worry about them coming to Philadelphia before Slammiversary is that I knew that they were going to try to tap into ECW. And I don't think anyone cares about ECW. I say it all the time. I was like a fucking teenager when that was hot. You know, now I'm a fucking old man. No one, no one gives a shit. I promise you. Uh, this match ends with. Oh, yeah, and Tom Hanfan. I love it. Of course you do. When he said it was going to be a street fight, he was, he was a pig in shit. He was, he was so excited. And a kick out. What the hell? So this match ends with a low blow being delivered to Rhino. And like Stone Cold says, followed by the worst roll-up in the history of the business. And then we get a post-match attack angle. Of course we do. It's PCO and a kick out. What the hell? After that, Tasha Steeles versus Giselle Shaw. I enjoyed this because it was very fresh. This is Tasha's contractually obligated match that she'll do, and then she'll disappear for the next two months. I noticed they went back to the quintessential diva rather than the quintessential knockout. So they tried very hard for about a week to rebrand that. I guess it was a complete bomb. I don't know. So she's back to being the uh, quintessential diva. Let me tell you about Tasha Steeles, folks. Tasha Steeles is the best knockout in this company. Now, let me let me explain. Jordan Grace is going to go down as the best knockout in TNA history. She's going to surpass Gail Kim and, and all these chicks, Mickey James. She's going to surpass them all. She's, she's going to be remi- remembered as the best in the history of the company. That being said, currently, to me, the best knockout is Tasha Steeles. As far as I, I'm ranking these very differently, I just mean in, in the context of the television show right now, Tasha Steeles, which I can't believe they haven't turned her baby face, by the way, but she has it all. She can wrestle. She has presence. She has charisma. She can talk. Her entrance is unlike anyone else's. So I'm just saying, I know it's a little contradictory. I just mean when you're when you're looking at the grand scheme of things, their 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 entire run, what they've done, championships, Jordan Grace is gonna go down as the best. But to me, like Tasha Steeles is the one who has everything on this roster. She's a little small, obviously. But other than that, she she has everything. Um, Giselle Shaw, she has this shock and awe move that I wish was her finisher instead of that moth, whatever the moth knee strike that she does, which she hit very well this episode. I had asked someone in TNA, why doesn't she do the corkscrew? Because I remember when they signed her, I got on the podcast, I'm like, yo, you want to see a cool finisher? Wait for Giselle Shaw's finisher. And then we get her running and hitting people with a knee. Uh, and the reason was is because they she can't hit it consistently, so they don't want it to be her finisher. She's tried it twice in TNA, and she's missed twice. When I say missed, I mean she hit it, 
but she like landed on someone's legs or she overshot it. So, um, you know, clearly she's not, she's not going with that, but it, it is a great move. The shock and all, I, I would rather, it's like a um, full Nelson backbreaker into a face plant. Like that should be her finisher. I dig that. So this was the first match on Giselle Shaw's road to bound for glory. I, I'm very confident in saying that she will face Jordan Grace at bound for glory. It will put Giselle Shaw over. And then, uh, then Jordan Grace, you know, she, maybe she'll do the, the North Carolina show, the TNA plus show, but then, uh, then she'll be done. So I think, um, I think it's an odd choice a little bit for obvious reasons. But I am a fan of Giselle Shaw, so I'm not against it. But, you know, the reason I say I say this confidently is because, you know, they, they had to convince her to stay with the company. She was going to leave with Scott. It got ugly backstage. She has this random baby face turn where she's aligned with Gail Kim. So that makes, you know, Gail Kim's rarely on the show, but uh, she's been on the show a couple times. It's clearly... If if Gail Kim is involved with you on screen, it's a big deal. It's something like serious is going down. This isn't some fucking bullshit. So even though I thought eventually Masha was was the possible replacement for Jordan, the one I was going to kind of take over for her, it, it's hard to do that because on screen she doesn't speak English, even though she speaks perfect English. But on screen she doesn't speak it. So I think Giselle Shaw is the one that they are going to uh, to anoint as, as the next knockout. So I think this was the first match on her road to Bound for Glory. I don't know how they're going to get there. It's probably going to do some number one contender shit. She, it, it's going to be her. It's going to be her at Bound for Glory. I, I feel good about saying that. Um, and then Jordan will put her over on the way out. So I have Brookside backstage does an interview with um, Gia Miller. She has her sights set on Alicia Edwards. I'm down for that. I'm down for that match next week. Probably my two favorite knockouts at the moment. So I'm uh, I'm looking forward to that quite a bit. And Gina Miller asks, is she a, is she going to be able to come back after this heinous attack? Yes, Gia. We just saw her in a bathing suit. Looking fine. Looking perfectly fine. Um, earlier in the episode. So unless she was in a coma... Or in the hospital the last two weeks, which she wasn't. Uh, she's she's okay. So I, I promise you, she survived going through a table. She's a wrestler. Wrestlers go through tables and then show up on the episode the next week. So she did survive this heinous attack. Yes, Chris Bay versus Johnny Dango Curtis. This match was good for what it was. It wasn't too terribly long. Uh, it ends with Chris Bay when he comes in the ring. Dango hits the leg drop. I thought that was a very nice visual. I thought that looked good. Uh, it's crazy that Dango's kind of getting that little bit of a push now. He's, he's beating some dudes, so maybe he is part of the system. Who knows? But um, hits the leg drop. Guess what the fuck happens after the, the match? Post-match attack. That is the That is the formula, folks. And then the main event of this program was Joe Hendry, Josh Alexander versus Moose and Steve Macklin. So I, I've been talking a little bit about this main event at Slammiversary, saying that I, I don't like it. I think it's lazy. And the reason being is because we have arguably the strongest main event uh, group of main eventers in this company that we've had in Years, maybe even a decade. You're talking all six people in this match. You're talking about Mike Santana. You're talking about Eric Young. You're talking about the Hardys. You can still throw Sammy Callahan, Eddie Edwards in there when necessary. Uh, you know, Bay and Austin in a pinch could be used. You got Alex Hammerstone on paper. I mentioned last week I... Don't think he's coming back. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong. That's just BQ talking. Trying to read between the lines of some things. I do not think he's coming back. 
Um, but my point in, in, in bringing this up is this is the largest group of main eventers we've ever had. I shouldn't say ever, but I mean in the last several years, okay? You understand what I'm saying. But they're throwing them all in one match. And it's like if if you have this many top guys, if you were able to sprinkle them throughout the card, you would have something. You'd have something pretty special, something, you know. There's been Slammiversary cards, man. I remember I went to Slammiversary one year. We got Grado and on the main card, Grado and Shira versus... Man, it was the team Al Snow was managing. They had come from NXT. They were like a couple foreign dudes. I'm just saying we've had Slammiversary cards where where there's half the people have no business being on the main card. You know, and you've got this like really deep roster right now. And we're just throwing everybody in one match and then giving the rest of the show this slow-ass build. Mike Santana has nothing to do at the show. Nothing. Eric Young, nothing. You know, it's not like they didn't even find something something else for them to do. So um, that that was the disappointment for me, is that you could have sprinkled uh, some of these guys throughout the show, done something cool with them, got them a little bit of momentum, and then you know move on from there. But but we're gonna get them all in the same match. Five of them are gonna lose. Joe Hendry comes out extremely over. For those of you who are saying Joe Hendry was buried because of what happened at NXT, listen to the crowd. Listen to these people. This So, man, I meant to say this at the top of the show. The crowd had so much energy at the very beginning. Now, it died throughout the show, but they had so much energy in the very beginning. And I know last week I had said they sounded just like the Cincinnati crowd. Maybe I was wrong. Maybe, maybe that I, I just heard incorrectly. But I heard this episode, them having a lot of energy. They sounded very, very good. It sounded organic and it sounded natural. So if you've been to a TNA show, if you've been to a wrestling show on TV, period, they'll say, hey, we're going live in three, two, one, and then everybody fake cheer. So TNA is no different. Everyone fake cheer and it shows all the people fake cheering in the beginning. It didn't sound like that when this show kicked off. It sounded like people were genuinely cheering because they wanted to, not because they were being told to. And I thought it sounded like old school TNA. So I just thought it, it started it off with a lot of energy and it sounded it sounded very, very good. But Joe Hendry, for those of you saying he was buried, buried, and I don't know the, the textbook definition, but bur- buried means you are irrelevant. The fans don't care about you. You know, Ash by Elegance is, is buried. You know what I mean? Um, you get on screen and you're losing and the company clearly has no no interest in pushing you like that's buried. You know what I'm saying? Like Joe Hendry is not buried. Joe Hendry uh, stumbled into a, a best case scenario. And um, he's, he's over with the people. But then Josh Alexander comes out and you hear audibly the crowd just die off. And again, it's the fucking song. It is the song because you can't, you don't hear it. <laughs> And then start cheering at the top of your lungs. That's just not how that shit works. Um, I thought we were going to get a break from Joe Hendry talking, but he said, "He said, hey, you didn't think we were going to start without hearing from him." I, I thought it would just been a nice break where he didn't have to talk this time because what he he didn't say anything. Then Moose and Macklin come out. We get Frankie Kazarian on commentary. Great tag team match. Great main event. Crowd was into it. I would have guessed that Hendry would pin Macklin. I didn't, it, what I did not expect was that Josh Alexander would be pinned. It almost seems like Josh is a little bit of an afterthought lately. Maybe it was ever since that whole scenario where they picked up his option, but he is not being presented. Now, again, I don't want him. I, I said, I don't believe he should be anywhere near the main event, but he's not being presented as a main eventer. Like when, even though he was wrestling Hammerstone and it wasn't for the, a title, he was being presented like a main eventer, right? He had they had two big time matches that were very good, great storyline. Like that was probably the best storyline that's been uh, going on this year. But it almost seems like he's a little bit of an afterthought because they would have never pinned Josh Alexander a year ago, never, 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 never. 
Well, especially not if he was a champion, but they would have never pinned him. Especially if Steve Macklin would not have pinned him. My one problem here, nitpicking from what was a good match, was that they have, this is a go-to crutch finish that they use. Have the two baby face bump into each other. Uh, the heels get them from behind. They did it. They did it multiple times with Trinity and her opponents because they kept putting her versus baby faces. Uh, they did it multiple times, put them in a tag team together, bump into each other, her partner gets taken out or, or whatever the case. So this was basically exactly what they did here. The two run into each other. Moose hits Josh Alexander with the spear. And then uh, then uh, Steve Macklin, I believe, hits him with the KIA. And then that's it. One, two, three. I thought it was a great visual for Steve Macklin to be to have won, to be on top. You know, they didn't go uh, a predictable finish route as far as who pinned who. So um, I can dig it. Just the, the that exact finish happens happens too often. But, um, you know, other than that, good way to end the show. So I've got a mailbag episode coming up here pretty soon. I think it's it's got a little inside stuff for you guys. So I think you're going to dig it quite a bit. Um. I'll be recording that very soon. I may record it today. I, I, don't, I don't know. I was going to record it today, but I had to do this podcast. So, you know, we'll see what happens. But uh, thanks for swinging by. We'll see what happens on the episode next week. It looks like another pretty good one. And I know that I break this shit down and I and I nitpick almost every single uh, thing about the show, but it, it doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. Like, trust me, if I didn't like this shit, I wouldn't watch it. I promise you. I do not put myself through uh, stuff I don't like. I punched out on WWE. I punched out on AEW. I punched out on it for a period of time on NWA. You know, if, if it's a sitcom I'm watching, a series, and it gets bad, I will punch out. Like, I do not force myself to watch something that's not good. So, um, please do not mistake my criticisms for not enjoying the show and not liking it. That's all I've got. That'll do it for me. I'm your boy, BQ. Catch me soon for the, the mailback episode, and uh, we'll do it up real big. I'm out. Peace.